Hello. Thanks for listening to the Go Beyond Disruption podcast, where we share insights from inside the accounting and finance profession that help you stay ahead of the curve, whatever sector you work in. I'm Kyle Hannan. I'm based in the AICPA and SEMA office in the heart of London's financial district. This week's episode is called The Remote CFO, Transforming Tactical Historians to Agile Choreographers. And we'll be talking to an expert guest, Robin Thiem, who is CEO and founder of KBS CFO. And also you'll find her online under the hashtag Future Ready CPA. She'll be telling us about being a remote CFO, why the challenges of remote work aren't necessarily the ones we think they are. How do we nurture independence and effectiveness, manage effectively as leaders without working alongside people all the time, but also without micromanaging the ones that we're working virtually alongside? And what about the security element? There's so much that we need to be doing today. It's almost too late to be an early adopter because things are becoming faster and more competitive. Robin Thiem will tell us all about being a virtual outsourced leader. Uh, That's because she knows it well. She's a change agent with a sense of humour and humility. She's been an AICPA speaker and a CPE author. Uh, She's acquired a CPA, a CGMA, a CITP, along with experience in so many sectors, especially with software implementation. Uh, She listens, she observes, she collaborates. And what's even better is that she talks as well, which is why she joins us. Uh, Robin Thiem, where are you joining us from today? Hi, Kyle. I'm joining you from Kensington, Maryland, right outside of uh, Washington, D.C. We're right on the D.C. line. We're talking to you from the heart of London's financial district. The city itself is getting noisier outside, even as our office is getting quieter. So I thought it's a perfect opportunity to sit and talk to you about the offices, not so much of today, but of tomorrow. Now, we've said quite a lot about you and the work you've done, but what have I left out? Give us a sense of what your last 20, 25 years have looked like. The way that I became a change agent today was natural and started with me um, in public accounting and even before that, where I uh, would always be looking for a way to automate anything. And I was fascinated with tools that would let me do that. We, I was uh, worked in public accounting and then um, progressed from there to uh, working um, on the inside, as us management and CFO accountants might call ourselves, uh, with um, controller and CFO roles, many times in the real estate and construction industry. I also worked for a bank in the 80s where uh, there was a need to uh, automate a variety of things. So uh, in my roles um, as one of the contributors on the financial side, I always found myself getting involved with the um, need for automation to address some of the, the financial um, reporting and, and compliance requirements along the way. Um, and then I worked um, at one point implementing uh, accounting software uh, for a variety of companies and, and eventually decided to start KBS CFO in 2004, seeing a need for uh, virtual CFOs on a fractional basis and also building accounting departments for growing businesses. And that's what we've been doing since then. How does what you're doing now connect with our topic today, the, the, the virtual CFOs and the, the changes of mindset that we need to be focusing on for, for really getting ready for what's coming up? One of the focuses is actually, I think, super common within my industry as well as across the board for, for many organizations where I'm deciding to focus in on a few niche businesses and um, really become uh, knowledgeable about those those particular industries and their nuances, including manufacturing, e-commerce. Especially, I really love working with people that make products for consumers and make make um, you know basically producing any kind of um, tangible product is, is is something I really enjoy. But I also work with government contractors and general contractors who, of of course, make beautiful homes and so forth. Um, So just focusing in on those niches and um, recognizing that there's a lot of other talented people that have a focus in the nonprofit industry or other industries 
um, where you really uh, can help somebody by going deep, so to speak. And th so that's one of the initiatives I'm involved with. And another initiative is recognizing and helping some of my very small startups um, with uh, their getting off on the right foot, but um, partnering with a um, so one of these firms that's using proprietary, um, very uh, highly automated software to um, virtualize and, and um, make, make their entry into the small business world successful where they are able to pay, afford to pay for, um, you know, bookkeeping services on a really small scale. So those are just a couple of the things I'm focusing on. Of course, um, just like... Uh, Again, many of my colleagues, security is, is huge and focusing on, on ways to address all of the security needs in the new environment we're in is vital as well. And I think it's also vital to remind people that with your focus on working with manufacturers, people involved in, in actual commerce, people making real stuff, we can so often have these conversations about virtualization and technology, but the thing is, it's all got to be powering real business. It's got to be powering transactions. It's got to be providing uh, a way for people to provide things of value to, to clients and customers that, that drive an economy uh, and moves it forward. This stuff doesn't just happen in cyberspace. So I think this is a, a practical um, reality. You know, it's, it drives business. It's not existing for the sake of itself, um, which is, I think, why your core expertise is really important, especially when we're talking about, you know, remote work and the virtual CFO. The whole point is for things to be actually happening more effectively on the ground. So why did you develop your skills in this direction? And how do you use those skills in the, the work you're doing right now? Well, Kyle, I'll be honest with you. I have found as I uh, learn more and more about myself professionally that I'm not well suited for repetitive um, routine tasks. <laughs> and so I, almost um, my, my, um, my interest in automation and um, leveraging um, software in a way it um, came together by me recognizing a weakness that I wanted to turn into a strength. And I ultimately re realized that when I was assigned any type of routine or, uh, you know, uh, something that a repetitive task, uh, tallying trial balances or, or entering transactions earlier in my career that, um, in order to succeed, I needed to find a way to automate that and, and, uh, and then ultimately convince those around me that, you know, the results of that automation, you know, could, could be uh, greater than the original work assignment. So it, it really started in a way as a protective measure <laughs> so, for my, for my uh, knowing myself. And also the fact that it was based on real lived worked experience. You saw the need in front of you and did something about it. This is not something you just dipped into because you read a book about it. This is, this is real life, real business. And that's why you've moved in this direction of the, the remote CFO. And in fact, uh, the reason we've called this episode uh, Remote CFOs, Transforming Tactical Historians, uh, into agile choreographers makes it very clear that this is something that's important right now. So to talk us through what those words mean and, and give us a sense of why this is so finger on the pulse. I've really come to realize that the term early adoption is about to be displaced by uh, constant learning and uh, being an agile and nimble adopter of the change that's being presented to you and is available. So, Robin, what are those challenges? What are the obstacles, the issues we have to, to dance around as we agilely choreograph our, our way into the future? What are the challenges of, of remote working? What's your particular take on what it takes to manage this new style of not only working, but managing and leading remote teams? I've had a remote workforce since 2004. And prior to that, I had developed practices for remote work as in just from a practical standpoint as a as a mother with growing children so I've been um, working in this environment and dealing with these challenges 
for over 20 years. And I think one of the biggest challenges that I um, have encountered is really centered around effective communication uh, with your with your workforce and making sure you're all working at common purposes and communicating in a, an effective manner. That applies in particular, I would say, to people that need the time to dig in on work that requires great thought, but also need to be communicating with um, their team members and, and letting us all know um, how things are progressing. So I've really str um, struggled with that, to be honest with you, at times to make sure that we have uh, a constant pulse on the work we're doing when we're not just down the hall with one another. Um, I, I've also found that management is um, managing people um, when they're not right near you is, has, is like a particular skill set that we're all developing. Um, it's very different than, again, when you can read body language and they're right in front of you. So uh, just developing those skills and, it, and making sure those around you are um, you know effectively managing the people um, as as they um, um, work with you, including training programs and having effective training programs that work in a remote work um, environment. So lots of challenges, lots of opportunity, of course, but it's um, it definitely uh, is not something to be taken for granted. And I think some people do uh, walk into the concept of remote work and think it's for everyone and eventually it may be but I do see that some people really uh, are not as comfortable in that environment as others. You've spoken before about the role of a remote leader as almost something like a and you used a sports term like a, a quarterback flesh that out for us because I thought that was quite interesting for a start explain to us for those people not familiar with American football what is a quarterback and why does that apply here as a good description of that role in American football the quarterback is uh, the individual that decides all the plays, at least this is my understanding of the quarterback, or, uh, decides on all the plays that are going to be implemented, as well as um, who's going to be involved and um, the step-by-step -step elements of the um, upcoming plays. So it's, uh, of course, it's done in collaboration and there's lots of feedback and there's a lot of great metaphors about that role. But essentially, um, they are looked at as a leader, but they, they're, you know, they're, everyone is depending on one another. So I really find it to be a fantastic metaphor to describe the type of work that uh, CFOs are expected to do and need to be doing. Um, similar to that role, we um, really need to be looking at our playbooks and deciding, you know, who's going to be uh, the best capable of implementing these solutions uh, and, and um, really looking over the scene and making scenario and um, decisions as far as what, what's going to happen, as well as like building on that metaphor, knowing when to pivot and all those good things I could build on a sports metaphor forever, because <laughs> I do find there's so much relevancy in that. Unlike a game, which normally lasts like 90 minutes, I mean, disruption is 24-7, seven, seven days a week, things are always changing. So if you had to think back about the last big change that you saw in this space, moving off the, the sports field and back into the business world, what was the last big disruption that you saw in the world of tech and perhaps in, in virtual work or the ways that organizations were starting to take stuff off premise and, and maybe put it somewhere else, maybe before the cloud? What, what was happening? Yeah, well, I mean, uh, th there's there's two big disruptors, but I'm going to focus on one that uh, is a little mundane, but it really was the underpinning of of all of the remote work that we're experiencing. It's this this concept of um, virtualization of the server platform. So I'm not I'm not a IT um, certified professional, although I mean I am from the AICPA perspective, but I but I'm not. Um, certified to uh, work on hardware and so forth. But I recognize that what happened with this thing we're calling the cloud was the advent of virtualization within the servers where they, they 
the, they determined ways to literally, quote, virtualize machines and allow um, environments to be multiplied and quadrupled. And we're all able to do our remote work using that technology. So again, I'm probably not the best person to describe it um, to the level of, of accuracy that you know, one would need it if I was on an IT podcast, but, but it's really been the game changer that's resulted in us having this conversation about the cloud. Um, and ultimately, you know, our, our data is in data centers all over the world because of, because of that um, huge um, change. And, and uh, the second one, which is pretty related, is just the development of um, software that's pretty sophisticated but available as a service as opposed to the old school of loading software on our computers. That wouldn't be possible, frankly, without the virtualization, but um, from a direct impact and connecting the dots, being able to log in from anywhere to a software application that's quite capable of doing a, a lot of the tasks that we need really disrupted um, the, you know, the marketplace in general, but all, for sure the finance and accounting field in a very big way. And we see that happening every day now. And, and who is it affecting? Uh, what does this mean in practice when you, you look at, you mentioned the, the finance, the accounting sector, maybe the wider business uh, environment is is being disrupted and transformed all the time as technology changes and new ways of doing old things um, become more not only possible but more affordable and more practical and and easier. So so what what else is changing? I mean, are we starting to see that the people that work with all this technology changing the way they work as well? Well, there's a lot of expectation of change. I mean, there's, there's certainly a, a group of people that are not changing, and that, that's definitely a significant issue um, of workplace displacement. But then there's, there's a, a workforce that um, is interested, for one, in working for many employers and the, the concept of uh, working in one company for 40 years um, appears, you know, to be... Uh, an old concept that it's hard to envision being um, something that will be occurring in the future. So there's definitely uh, a change in the the workforce and what they are looking for. They are looking for organizations that are agile and, and able to provide rewarding work that's challenging and access anywhere and flexible schedules and all those good things. So I, I think none of that would be possible without the disruption I described earlier, um, but managers now need to adopt to recognize the capabilities of the technology. I mean, one, one example is um, used to be that you had a vision that somebody would be, quote, productive if they're sitting at a desk for eight hours, and they may be the least productive individual in the firm. So it's, it, there's a lot of different um, examples in terms of how we manage people uh, that, that need to change, as well as just um, what our workforce expects. I mean, de definitely the whole, what we're calling in the U.S., the non-employer, uh, that's individuals that essentially have no employees working for them, has, has just expanded significantly. And, and so, uh, we're, we're working in, a, in an environment with more independent contractors and uh, people more collaborating in the non-employee environment as well. The fascinating reality is that we can be gainfully employed. To many people, that means you're sitting there with a job at a desk. But these days, it's more a case of being effectively deployed, where you can be using the technology at your fingertips that we carry with us. You can be sitting on a train, you can be sitting on a bus, you can be sitting at a park bench, and you could be answering emails, checking spreadsheets, you could be in video conference with people, you could be hard at work wherever you are. There's plenty more to say about that, which is exactly what we'll be doing when we continue our conversation very shortly. We'll find out more about the challenges of working and managing remotely, and also talk about the mindset changes that need to happen in order to do this all as effectively as it could be done. All of that is coming up 
later in this episode of the Go Beyond Disruption podcast. It's brought to you by the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants. You can find out more about this podcast and about the rest of the work we do at gobeyonddisruption.com. And if you're a new listener, you've just discovered this podcast, remember to subscribe, get all new episodes absolutely free as soon as they come out. You'll get that via your podcast app. You can also have a browse through our older episodes where you'll find out a lot more about this topic as well as others, things like blockchain, AI, data analytics, human intelligence, leadership. We've got close to 100 conversations which focus on how technology is changing the profession. And they also talk about how we as professionals are rising to those challenges, how we're identifying opportunities and using our human intelligence to stay ahead of the curve, which is exactly what we're doing in conversation with Robin Thiem. She is telling us about virtual CFOs, remote working and being a future ready CPA. So let's look at it from the perspective of the remote CFO. Robin, what are the challenges here for remote or virtual leaders? How do we manage effectively without digging into the weeds and using all of that technology to become micromanagers? Yeah, that I have to say that is a very big challenge. And we um, uh, use at KBS CFO um, a number of software tools that really facilitate making sure we're all communicating with each other and working um, in a similar manner. Of course, I know, um, you know, there's, there's lots of fantastic finance and accounting software, but I really look at different productivity solutions that can help us to efficiently and effectively communicate and keep a pulse on things. So one of the tools that we use is Asana, which was developed by some of the folks at, at Facebook, actually, as I understand it. And it's um, one of many competitor tools that are used to essentially keep track of your workflow and um, uh, make sure you're communicating about where you are in tasks. So we use that tool and we use a tool for managing email within a team environment that allows us to have little side discussions. It's kind of a cool um, application that ups our email correspondence game so that we're not constantly buried in our inbox without clear direction as what the next steps are in developing action plans. I mean, one of my pet peeves about email is that many companies do end up using it um, either by plan or by lack of plan as a way of managing the work and managing their people. And there's better tools to use that are kind of specifically designed for the remote work environment in particular. And there's actually even um, some tools that are being developed to measure how satisfied we are with our job. So there's, there's all kinds of ways of keeping a pulse and leveraging tools when we're not sitting side by side that I recommend companies uh, use and, and, not, and don't take for granted, you know, when you don't hear from your remote workforce that, that all things are going uh, as as planned, uh, that that usually doesn't work out that well. And you've reminded us that not everything can be virtualized. On the one hand, there's the temptation to think, well, the enterprise tools or the the, the tools that we may have used while we were all working in in the office together uh, can just be the same ones we use if we're virtualizing or we're working remotely. That's not always the case. You have to pay attention to how people work with the software, with the tools, but also how you're able to work with those yourself as a leader to be able to sit back and just let the work continue without feeling you have to be buried in the weeds the whole time just because the technology may make it possible. But there are some practical realities that you cannot virtualize. You have to take care of your employees, even at a distance. So fill us in about the practical side of virtual workforces. As a leader, you still have to think about things like health and safety, don't you? Yes, you, d- you definitely, you know, essentially the picture I painted a few minutes ago where the there's a growing non-employer workforce and independent contractors or even just the remote workforce, everybody that um, works for KBS CFO is an employee. So we're kind of uh, conventional in that respect. But um, so those employees, they're all working 
all over um, the country and they are mostly working um, either from a um, one of these uh, co-working spaces or their homes and so there's there's a practical standpoint that you need to make sure that their workplace which used to be an office that we all walked into but their workplace is is you know um, basically properly insured and um, that they are um, if they're while they're working for you um, that that they um, are being in, in a safe environment and um, safe as far as physically safe, of course, that's the first thing a lot of people think of with safety. But then of course there's, you know, you can you have to talk about safe from a security perspective too. And you know, there's one other part of this, Kyle, that I, I touched on, but I'll just kind of circle back to it. And I, it's just been a lesson that I've learned again and again and again. As a leader, we tend to talk at people at times, I, I, just to be from a practical standpoint. And you can learn that if you're not too careful, that the people that you're communicating with really didn't have a clear understanding of the assignment or the communication that you're having. And it can be more challenging in a remote environment where you can't look at body language and see one another. So it's really important in a remote environment, having a procedure where you confirm understanding with each other and that it's a two-way conversation. It's not a one-way conversation. Leaders can get, including myself, can get caught up in having too many one-way conversations. So I hope it's okay to circle back on that one. It's like a lesson I learn every day. Well, let me just show you that I have been listening and that I have been paying attention and that I am confirming that what I've heard is what I thought I've heard. So you're telling me that there are ways that remote leaders can make a little bit more of a, a change in the way that they conclude communications that make sure that those communications landed in the right way. Is that right? That is right. And I just, I, there's a funny story or visual, if I could, that I, I think of where, um, Kyle, I'm going to tell you to go down to the coffee shop. It's four blocks. You're going to take a left, a right, a left, a right, a left, a right. And you say, got it. And, and I always laugh, like, I have no idea if you got it or not. I mean, maybe you'll end up at that coffee shop and I'll hear from you in a few hours or something. But I, it's like a common thing where I'll say to somebody, do you know that that person really followed the instructions that you've just provided? And they'll say, yeah, they told me they understood them. So, so I, I act, unpack that a little bit and, and really encourage management practices that allow for that to be validated. So I'm not going to say got it. What should I be saying in future? Well, I think one of the tools that we use um, that, that seems, you know, again, none of this is that novel, but one of the tools is just when we're using a remote screen sharing tool, just as one simple example, instead of having the person who's providing the instructions drive, so to speak, the person who's learning and receiving the instructions should be the driver. They should be providing witness that they're taking a few notes, but also throughout that screen sharing time together that they're demonstrating that they understand the instructions. So uh, that's one very, very simple way that we use. I think that is so practically useful because we know that in many of these screen sharing, these video conferencing tools you can get, if you are having uh, remote workshops, if you look closely, there is often the option to let someone else take control of the presentation. So what you are saying is if you're giving someone a walkthrough of a process, for example, rather than just having them sit and mutely watch what you're doing on screen, what you should do is let them take control of the presentation and then walk and talk them through it as they use the screen rather than watch you do it. And that puts something straight into muscle memory. That's what you're talking about. Yep, exactly. And I think at times we don't have the patience, you know, or we, we might put that into a box of we don't have the time for that type of thing. But this falls into the box of like, 
effective learning and, and the, you know, some of the things that we've touched on really like ultimately if you're going to be uh, addressing change, then you have to have good ways to adopt it. And, and so by not making sure and confirming that the people around you understand um, how you're leveraging a particular tool or, or following some instructions, you can actually waste resources and not achieve the goals that, that we're looking for. Right to the beginning of our conversation, you talked about how you're working more and more with people making stuff. And you've reminded me that in the accounting and finance profession, there's an increasing focus on business partnering, how the old way of doing things. And I think you were you were talking about this as um, the legacy model, those tactical historians now having to be more almost tactile. They have to be more in touch with their clients as business partners. And even if an accounting or finance practice isn't considering going fully remote, going fully virtual, they still have to be aware of the realities of uh, moving in that direction so they can offer effective, useful consulting services to their clients who may be considering it. So what I'm hearing you say is this idea of virtualization isn't useful only to those who are thinking about doing it for themselves, but it also offers an accounting or finance uh, practice, a means of offering a new service, a way of delivering services to their own clients who may be needing your advice so that they can do this effectively. How would they do this? How would a practice take on this as a service they can offer and advise on to clients who may be considering going in that direction? The first step in moving towards this type of service that I provide is really understanding a few of the industries that you want to speak to. Just as you were saying, I, I work with organizations that make things. I have a strong um, background in the accounting of manufacturing. And I like, I like working in that space for sure. So um, you have to start there because it really is, it is a skill to understand um, a business's um, back, back office operation, so to speak. And then of course you want to understand what they're selling and what their services are that they're providing products and services. So I, I do need to start there. And I think it's really important to, um, understand, um, the general business environment. And I think, uh, you know, at times my colleagues, some of my colleagues or in the past would focus on the skills, the accounting skills that they have, and not as much on actually the outcomes and the businesses that we're, we're trying to support. So I, you know, again, I think that's a big part of the change is that we're actually becoming business cheerleaders, quarterbacks, or whatever the term, you know, we want to pick choreographers, another one that, that we, you and I have talked about, where we're really um, going deep on the, in, in terms of the business. And so we want to understand what makes them tick and actually uh, respect it and, and be deferential to those business owners that are you know, so amazingly creative and smart in what they do. So once, once we've gotten you know, that understanding, um, then, then we're basically going to want to try to build a support model around what that business truly needs to be able to sustain and grow over the next few years. And, and that to me is a key part of the way you want to deliver your services. What's sustainable for them to grow and then build a solution around that. And when you're doing that, what kind of change of mindset do you think needs to happen? The big change that, again, we have touched on this numerous times throughout our conversation today, but it's really that both the business owners and the profession needs to migrate from what, what I'm terming a tactical historian where we're really capable. I don't want that to sound like anything other than it's a very important role from our past where we were capturing the stories of what was happening in, in businesses that story's um, capable of being captured and it needs to be at a much more almost real-time basis and um, move forwards to being a nimble, agile choreographer of what's going on in the business or again, that quarterback role. A part of that mindset is accepting and embracing the concept that 
just being very specific within the finance and accounting industry for just a second, is that cost of capturing transactions is being driven down by primarily software companies that have really seen an opportunity here to take what used to take hours and maybe cost, let's say a dollar, that same transaction is now being driven down to practically costing a penny to manage. And so uh, we wanna be supporters of that change. It's, it's a positive thing. It provides a lot of opportunities so that we can ultimately be focusing in on where business is going. It was what we were expected to do. We had to spend quite a bit of our resources in the past to figure out where we've been. We don't need that as much anymore. We need to leverage a lot of fantastic resources that are being developed to help us with the um, history and then, and then focus on going forward. And, and part of that um, mindset also needs to be centered around gaining feedback from what's going on, what's working and what's not, being open to um, recognizing that as you um, uh, make some changes in the organization that you see merited, that the first um, attempt may, may not produce the exact result that you expected. I just actually had a conversation with someone this morning that we've been working on a project together and, and uh, the, the outcome right now is not what either of us expected, but we both recognize that change uh, needs to be made. So we're, we're kind of going back to the drawing board, looking at the feedback that we've gained from, from the work we've done so far and, and leveraging it. So it's really valuing that process is, is, is a key part of that mindset change. I've heard it said that no battle plan survives contact with the enemy. So you've said that unexpected consequences uh, perhaps should be expected. Uh, no plan, no, no, no plan is perfect. So talk, talk me through some of the other things that may be getting in the way of of making these kind of things happen? If there's a step change that the remote CFOs typically need to make to actually take on this move from the kind of the, the non-automated nine to five to the, the automated remote virtual 24 seven, what's stopping them from moving from this kind of tactical historians of the past to these nimble choreographers of the future? Yeah, I, th I think um, we're, we are having, um, you know, the advantage uh, as we as a, you know, general society of learning about much faster what all of our colleagues and competitors and uh, businesses around us are doing. And we hear a lot about all these really cool things, artificial intelligence, blockchain, all the cool stuff that Go Beyond Disruption, frankly, talks about. It's really it's so fun and interesting to listen to, but the practicality can be that we're still mired in the weeds of that tactical historian job because it really can be difficult to come out from under it. And um, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that a financial report is due to, due to somebody and they're waiting for it. And at times it may require that the most senior person in the company, you know, is, is, literally entering um, all the nuances of a transaction into the system. And, and uh, you know, that's not the visual that um, we're painting here and go beyond disruption in particular, but it is a reality that at times is we're faced with is that the, 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 the pile of work in front of us can kind of get in the way and it's very challenging. And, and I won't, I don't think anybody should paint it as easy, but you do have to, at times um, prioritize investing in, um, in change that's not going to have your immediate needs met. So I think um, carving out some time, and, and I know some of your other guests have talked about this too, and I'll just compliment that, is, is really essential um, to, to getting past that. But I do recognize, and I think it's important to say it out loud, that there's a lot of listeners that are struggling with the real world practicality that we want everything to be automated, but it certainly is not today. And there's plenty of roadblocks along the way that we shouldn't get discouraged by, frankly, but they are there. Yeah, there are options and nothing gets easy easily. 
that's reality. So let's keep an eye on, on what's coming up around the corner. What do you think the next disruption in this virtual CFO, this future CPA world will be? Well, we're in the middle of the disruption um, where we're basically watching this conversation about artificial intelligence and trying to find where artificial intelligence and machine learning and and some of the capabilities of the machines around us and trying to figure out where do we fit into that picture and how can we um, ultimately leverage these new inventions. And so I think um, the disruption is going to be centered around our mindset being turned into some fast learning and creative mindset that can work with this real-time delivery of information. The other thing that I think is, is really, I guess it's a disruption, is just like the concept of the value of data changing from something that was viewed as only on the cost side to something where people are wanting to accumulate more and more data and they find that the data collection process has practically no value or is starting to have no value and the data itself is king. Um, so, you know, what's going to happen with that? I guess I'll say in the CFO industry, I'll, I'll step back from just finance and accounting and say that CPAs are going to be expected to be able to continue to be the chief navigators around what a world that's going to have a lot of complexities to it that we actually probably can't even fully imagine right now. So we're still going to be expected to um, help unpack the chaos of the next disruption. And, and I'm excited about it, but uh, I, you know, I know it's, it's challenging to do that, but that's, I think, what's going to be expected of us. So it's time to make it a bit easier for someone to get going. If someone wants to get started with this uh, journey or dig a bit deeper into this topic, what should they type into their search engine right now so that they can, in fact, start to move from that um, historical that tactical historian to the, the nimble choreographer you're talking about. What are some resources you'd recommend? Well, I guess um, I, I know, Kai, you don't know that I was going to say this, but I, I do think that this podcast series that you're producing, I, and I've really been enjoying listening to a number of the guests that you've had on. So I think that I would encourage your listeners to go back and listen to some of the productions you have from earlier because that you're talking about your your conversation is the one we should have. For me, talking to my CPA colleagues, I would encourage you to check out some of the really innovative learning that's going on in, in some of the AI CPA and CPA continuing education. There's there's a lot of effort going into thinking about this disruption. The other thing I think is really important is to uh, really understand um, this artificial intelligence and machine learning and, and um, participate in some dem demonstrations of applications that you might not really see an immediate need for, but really sit down just as a, like almost from a curiosity perspective to sit in on a demo or two of software and then allow your mind to wander to how that software could help you as opposed to all the challenges of making a change to implement it. So, um, you know, that I would, that's not necessarily a resource in particular, but it's, I think it's a, it's a good practice to consider even for those that consider themselves in a leadership role, kind of understanding the capabilities around you without necessarily having somebody tell you that something can't be done when other software companies are doing amazing things. And if someone thinks they want to go straight to the top and speak to you directly, where would they find you online? What's the website? Do they find you on LinkedIn? What's the best way you can point them to? Well, definitely um, easily findable on LinkedIn. And then my uh, website is kbscfo.com. And I would welcome anybody wanting to reach out and continue our conversation or talk about any of the things we've discussed today. I'm always happy to do so. 
Super, and we'll put links to that in the show notes. Now, what we need to do is get one last bit of advice from you, an actionable suggestion that you'd like to leave for accounting and finance professionals that help them go beyond disruption. What's one piece of advice you'd leave them with? My one piece of advice would be to embrace learning and listening and value being a change agent. Embrace that. The risks of not doing so have become quite high. Thank you, Robin Feem. Great place to end our conversation today. And there is plenty more to explore about the topic of uh, technology, remote working, virtualization. Uh, the show notes to this episode will have links to the resources we've mentioned. And to view them, uh, you can click on the episode's info icon in the podcast app that you're using on your smartphone or your tablet right now, or on your computer. Open the episode in your web browser and you should be able to find everything right there. Two other websites we'd recommend for listeners interested in taking this further. You can go to cgmastore.com slash go beyond disruption or aicpastore.com slash go beyond disruption for courses, webinars, and other professional development resources sources to keep you ahead of the curve. And thanks again to our guest who's been doing a very good job of that, Robin Thiem. And of course, thank you for listening to this podcast. If you've enjoyed it, go tell someone about it, share it with colleagues and share your opinion with us. You can email us using the feedback link in our show notes. We'd love to know what you think and what you'd like to hear more of. From our London office in the heart of the City of London, I'm Kyle Hannan, and we'll be back soon with more conversations from inside the ARCPA and SEMA that help you and your profession to go beyond disruption. Till next time, goodbye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Beyond Disruption, brought to you by the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants. Learn more about today's topic at AICPA-CIMA.com forward slash disruption. This podcast is designed to provide illustrative information with respect to the subject matter covered and does not represent an official opinion or position of the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants or any of its subsidiaries or affiliates. It is provided with the understanding that the association, its affiliates, and subsidiaries are not engaged in rendering legal, accounting, or other professional services. If such advice or expert assistance is required, the services of a competent professional person should be sought. The association, its subsidiaries and affiliates make no representations, warranties, or guarantees as to and assume no responsibility for the content or application of the material contained herein and expressly disclaim all liability for such damages arising out of the use of, reference to, or reliance on such material.